All right, good morning, everyone. So thank you for choosing to come to the mini tutorials. Um, we do have the best room. It is also the coldest, though. So I hope you brought your coats. So this morning, I will be introducing um, Dr. Lenny Truitt, sitting down here next to me, and Charlie Middleton, who will be presenting on autonomy. So Lenny started at the STAT CUE back in 2012 at its inception. We are all STAT CUE members. And he began his work in, uh, with the 46 test wing for live fire testing and has been playing in the live fire realm ever since. He worked at IDA for a time before uh, coming over to the STAT CUE for, his, for our 12 years. And he has a bachelor's in aerospace engineering and a master's in aerospace engineering from Georgia Tech and a PhD in aerospace from UC San Diego. Charlie has been working at the STAT CUE with us since 2019. He is an Air Force test pilot who absolutely loves the F-16. He is an NPS Distinguished Grad and has uh, degrees in OR and OA from Princeton and AFIT. So please welcome my speakers and um, don't be afraid to ask questions during the session. It is an open discussion. Okay, thank you, Gina. Uh, so again, I'm Charlie Middleton. Uh, we're here to talk to today about autonomous systems and specifically about test and evaluation of autonomous systems. Uh, we've been working on this project. I've been working on this project for a little over two years. As, a, as an office, we've worked on this over the last about uh, five or six years. Um, and uh, we have a lot of great stuff to get through today. We've got about 70 slides. So if that deters you, you just want to leave, step out, that's fine. Uh, but as Gina said, we do want it to be sort of interactive. Uh, so we're going to pause for questions throughout. And if something doesn't make sense or you're wondering about more detail on something, We'll either try to answer it right away or, or point you to something or to get with you afterwards. Um, so that's me. Uh, and then Lenny? Yep. So um, like Charlie said, we've been working this on and off for a little while longer than that. Um, but what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the, kind of the work that we did. It got us to a certain point where we started creating a document. And that's what we're going to go over is this document that's existing right now. Uh, it's kind of in pre-release, but we want to get a lot of feedback from people, how you like it, what you think needs to be added. So that's why we're really going to look for a lot of feedback as we go through this. But it's going to have an overview of methods, tools, test capabilities, and some other things all related to the testing of autonomous systems. Um, so uh, again, so we have this guide. And then, then there's been some, I don't know if you're familiar or if you've been introduced to the, the, the guidebook format that dot and &E has been trying to put out. Um, it's gone through some changes. They're not exactly sure of what they want to do with that. But since this was already started when that process began, they said this could be one of the companion guides for autonomy. Um, but it was a little strange in that it was kind of out in front of the, the need. And so we've got this document we want to discuss it. We want to get it to the community, figure out how we want to use it. Um, you know, kind of in parallel, not, not separate, but also not necessarily directly tied to that because that was not the initiation of this. But we want to go over kind of where it came from. And basically through 2015 to 2019, there were a lot of people meeting. There was a COI for autonomy. There were some other groups. Um, and they all basically were coming up with lists of challenges. And uh, in the CLE 003 or 2, the, the autonomy class, same thing, different list. And so by 2019, we'd done a lot of admiring the problem. And so what we came up at that point was we said we just need to transition and start trying to document something. Again, a lot of these things weren't mature, but we just wanted to get something down to, to be able to share it. And that's where this, the genesis of this started. So we want to describe the current contact the format, where it is. Um, also explore, you know, are there other ways to do this? Can it be more flexible? We uh, ultimately would like to get it to an online resource, but um, we mostly want to make sure that we're capturing the right kind of things and we have a good format before we go to that step, um, identify additional contents and attain feedback on the format. We're going to be switching back and forth about every 10 or 15 slides. Please use those opportunities. If you were holding a question and you just didn't feel like it to ask it at those points, that is why the breaks are inserted in there. Um, at any point on the slides, if you want to raise your hand, if you have a comment question, absolutely uh, fair game. Whoops. Uh, so overview, again, we're just going to go through kind of the, the where this, what we have, uh, teeny companion guide, but that name is, is up for uh, modification for autonomy. We'll go through the introduction, the background material on it, kind of the, the motherhood stuff that we have in there, uh, central and specific challenges. And we're going to use this term autonomous military systems or AMS. 
The reason for that is to differentiate from autonomous civilian systems because there are additional considerations when you go into military applications in terms of the, the where they're going to be used, the operational space, but also the intent and the consequences are very different than civilian. So, so we've kind of coined this term AMS, and so you'll see that kind of follow through here. Uh, originally, it was autonomous defense systems, but people thought maybe defense versus offensive systems, so we've just changed the name, updated to autonomous military systems. Uh, but there are some uh, legacy pieces that will have that in there. Uh, then a, a framework for addressing the autonomy t &E challenges and then the bulk of this is going to be the specific methods, t &E infrastructure, tools, resources, and then ultimately spend some time on the plan ahead for the draft guide. And these are very sensitive. Okay, so the current status of where it sits is um, it is a completed draft, but not filled out. Um, but again, alt introduction, autonomy policy, which there is not a lot of, but we cover what, what we have discovered. Uh, the background and the context for autonomous military systems test and evaluation, as Charlie said, we are focused on TNEs very, very specifically here. Um, the TNE context, how things change when you go to autonomous systems versus traditional systems. Um, we do also include a relationship between autonomy and AI and ML. They get lumped together. I think the crowd here kind of understands some of the differences, but we're being very clear in the guidebook as what we're viewing autonomy and what we're viewing the T&E of, and we'll get into that, um, versus maybe the development and also then the AI and ML and how that interacts. Um, just trying to be documenting that well in the document. Uh, then again, the autonomous military system specific challenges, uh, kind of the overarching challenge, and then 12 challenges that we've developed, but again, there's many lists, and I think they do have a lot of similarity regardless of the source. Um, and then uh, the methods for addressing is next. We have a where to begin section to kind of set the framework because this document could be uh, for someone that's new to T&E or has a T&E background but new to autonomy. So kind of some level setting. And then, um, the, again, the bulk is where the tools are, the things that we've identified, and what we can state about them at this point. Um, it's much more of a shotgun approach uh, where you're gonna come in and you're gonna find the things that you like and get more information and it'll be a resource for it. It is not meant to be prescriptive in any manner. It is not exhaustive. It is not a thou shalt. It is strictly information available to the user to use however they see fit. Um, one of the things was as we went through this, there was a strong, um, belief that we needed to add in more about resources because people were curious what resources were out there, what other organizations. And so we've started to expand it with test labs, range support uh, capabilities, uh, and additional software tools are always growing and coming in. And then uh, finally, expertise. There are units that are doing this. There are, there are expertise. There's places to go. As every, every service is standing it up and inside the service, multiple things. We don't need to keep reinventing the wheel. So we want to have a central location that people can say, hey, I've heard about this, or I'm going to go talk to this guy first. Um, and then finally, summary way ahead. There's a lexicon that we keep at the end of it um, to help level setting, but we would gladly absorb or refer to anyone else if it becomes a definitive, but it was just another piece of information we thought was helpful inside of that. And then the references. And then just some of the things on the right that are contained in that is we do have the breakdown of the 12 challenges there that we have. Here's some of the example methods. So again, Gina said that we're all from the STATS COE, which is short for Scientific Test and Analysis Techniques Center of Excellence. So a couple of questions, who are we and why are we writing a companion or a draft guide for autonomy? Um, as she said, we were stood up in 2012 uh, by DT and E, which is DT, E and A now. Um, and the mission is to provide independent, this is very important, while we were funded from OSD, we are independent of the DTE and A function, uh, but integrated STAT, scientific test and analysis techniques, consultation to acquisition project, pro, uh, programs and projects to improve t and &E rigor, effectiveness, and efficiency. So if you think back in 2012, that meant design of experiment but it's gone way beyond that. It's all the things that we're talking about here because while organizations may have that, 
each of the acquisition programs probably do not have that inherent in their staff. So the idea is to put someone that has the interest of the staff um, to help them adapt this because even with oversight, DOT and E through you know other organizations coming in and saying, hey, we want you to do these advanced analysis or we they were trying to push things down, the program obviously has a relationship with them that maybe makes it challenging for them to accept that. So the idea is that we go in, we work directly with the program managers to say, hey, this is what this means, these are the implications, and, and have them be able to generate these more advanced analytic and planning on their side. Um, Currently, the team is about eight PhD, 12 masters across statistics, engineering, um, different sciences. Uh, a lot of government background, a lot of military background is common. Um, I had 20 years TNE before, 10 years supporting DOT and E coming in. But then we also do have what we call the young guns, right? The, the hot statisticians coming out of school that, that know that. But we work very collaboratively because it takes all those pieces. You have to understand T and E, you have to understand acquisition, you have to understand the statistics to be useful to the people that we, we support. And um, so we bring the stat expertise and the tools to bear to help solve these challenges. So again, we don't have a lot of role, dele, or defined roles and responsibilities. We typically support the program, or if it's a project or a lab program, they come to us and we provide that piece to their team. And then, we, so we're broken down, we, we, we call it three lines of effort that we have. The first being direct stat consultation, and that can be task oriented where we work with the program. But we also have an ask a stat through our website uh, very, um, very engaged. We're constantly working on multiple ASCA stats. Think of it as small questions, but somebody's sitting there going, hey, I have an idea about a design. Maybe they know something, or they have no idea, but said, hey, be great to get some help. We're working with, uh, is it MQ4 Triton? They, they had some landing gear issues, and they needed to do some testing that has major implications on the operation of the aircraft. And so they knew that this was important, and so they just called up and they said, hey, can we you know, get some assistance on this? So that's available free of charge, just as um, ad hoc support. Um, all the way up to working with prod, uh, programs um, and to uh, the fact that we integrate with their test teams, and some of them have us on full-time uh, direct support, where they're actually paying for that to have people on site for various programs. Uh, the second part is the enterprise-wide. We do applied research. We support to strategy and guidance. We also work with emerging techs, new domains, uh, you know, stat for cyber. Uh, what are we doing with, um, you know, these things as they come up? They look to us because, again, we kind of have a we have a, a foot in the practical, but we also deal more we with you know with the research and bring that. And then finally, the workforce development. Uh, as we work with these programs, we do try to leave a residual capability and mentor and work with their folks to bring them up. They're not going to use something they don't understand, so it's no good for us to come in there without educating them. Uh, we coordinate with DAU. We're working with some of the credentialing, some of the programs, that some of the new classes they're developing we're involved with in various aspects. And we also do tailored classes. Um, but the biggest thing is, so why are we doing this? If you look to the right, experience from the direct consulting is the foundation for relevant, effective, enterprise-wide contribution and workforce development. And what we're doing out of this, we want to base on the people that are actually doing the work. Okay. Thanks, Lenny. Uh, my turn for a bit. So um, that was a lot of background on where we come from. Uh, let's talk more about autonomy now. So. A lot of people in this room probably already know this, but being this being a tutorial and the intent being that if you walk into what do I need to know about autonomy t &E from a baseline where you don't know anything at all to start with, uh, we're going to start there, right? So why is this important? Machines are soon going to do a lot of tasks that humans used to do. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, um, that people are excited about it. Cheaper cost, larger quantity, less human training involved, faster execution, safer, more survivable, lots of great things. The challenges are in when we create systems that are autonomous, uh, determining whether they're suitable, how their lethality, sus sustainability, adaptability, ethical use are gonna, are gonna um, uh, be evaluated um, in, in the context that they're, they're gonna be used. And in my opinion, autonomy t and &E is sort of a linchpin where a lot of disciplines all come together, right? It's from S&T, 
and other R&D functions to programs to the warfighter uh, operators users a lot all of that comes together in test and evaluation right that's where sort of the rubber meets the road so um, the goal uh, again of this project is we're trying to advance scientific practices you know things that are defensible for how we do test evaluation for autonomous systems uh, to basically lead to you know effective capability for the warfighter out there a lot of words on this slide, but the highlights are, you know, this is trying to talk about why, why do we need new t &E methods for autonomy? The basics are that autonomy brings capabilities that traditional systems don't have, right? Because we're replacing a human operator, uh, in many cases, with a machine or a, or a, uh, a computer. So that means uh, capabilities like perception, reasoning, deciding, learning, teaming, those are things that in the past a tank or a fighter jet or a whatever you, you know, want to pick a system, they don't do. That an operator does those on behalf of the system and employs a system with those. Uh, so it's testing those kind of capabilities and functions that uh, is what we're talking about here today. In addition, we have to imagine that in all future battle spaces, n nothing goes to war by itself, right? Everything's part of an integrated package. So autonomous systems are going to need to inter interoperate seam seamlessly with human operated systems. So how does the human teaming and human coordination interaction work between autonomous systems and, uh, and, and other human actors in the battle space? Um, so those are some overarching challenges. The methods and processes to, to determine this and evaluate systems this way just aren't existent because we haven't had to do this in the past. Uh, so that's why they're being developed in the S&T and R&D communities now. Um, and you know, so the goal is to, to gather those methods, tools, and best practices, be able to share them among the community so that everybody gets to go faster, we don't have stovepipe learning, and we can all leverage each other's you know, lessons learned uh, from different systems and different services as we move forward. Um, so you know, that being said, uh, who, who, is, who is this guide aimed at? Well, it's really anybody involved in the test and evaluation process for any autonomous systems. So that you know, includes test engineers, test planners, but also program managers, operational testers, uh, you know, staff agencies, even the, you know, the user needs to probably understand something about how autonomy is tested. Um, so our approach on this has been, first off, as Lenny said, we've spent a lot of time in the past talking about challenges and gaps, of which there are many. Uh, but then we want to talk about methods, processes, best practices, and lessons learned for folks that are actually doing autonomy test and evaluation. Uh, do that through collaboration with a bunch of folks. We've got a, a hard to read eye chart here probably of uh, about 40 organizations that we've had at workshops or working groups that we've um, engaged with in the past. And they range the gamut from Army, Navy, Air Force, Homeland Security, NASA, uh, academia and industry as well uh, that we've tried. So we're trying to take a very broad aperture and say, look, anybody who's got a valid method or, or test technique or lesson learned or tool, we want to be open to grabbing that, learning what's good about it and being able to share, share it and cross collaborate among the larger community. Um, as Lenny said, our, our primary product is currently planned to be a companion guide for autonomy, which is a written document to go with other t and &E guidebooks. Uh, but we also are, are wanting to make sort of a wiki or online resource available that's more adaptable um, as we move forward as well. Um, okay, and then we've had workshops in the past. We're probably going to have more in the future. So if you want to be involved in future autonomy workshops, uh, we're probably going to have two mini workshops later this year. Uh, you can contact us afterward to make sure that you get the invites. Okay, uh, again, at the start of the guide, um, as mentioned in the outline there, we start with a little bit of policy background for autonomy. There's very little, right, because this is a new uh, technology area for, for DOD. So 3000.09 is the DOD instruction called Autonomy and Weapon Systems. There was an old version from a couple years ago. It was just released again in January. There's a new version out. It's, it's a little bit longer and a little bit more detail on some pieces, but basically defines autonomous weapon systems, talks about you know, fully autonomous or human out of the loop versus human on the loop and human in the loop, semi-autonomous systems. Um, and it just generally requires that we have robust t and &E to evaluate effectiveness, suitability, reliability under realistic conditions, including adversary actions in there, um, and make sure that we understand the consequences of uh, unintended engagement or loss of control of systems. The biggest thing about this, this policy reg is it applies to weapon systems. So it specifically says in there 
that this applies to things that are intended to cause harm, right? Um, it does not apply to unarmed platforms. So there really is no policy guidance from DOD on the testing of systems and platforms that are not in some way a weapon, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so that's a little bit of a, a policy gap um, that I'm sure will be closed moving forward. Uh, there, you, some of you may remember there was an ethical principles memo from DOD a couple uh, years ago. That was now incorporated in the new revision, so the, the ethical principles for AI are, are in there now. And there's also a review process for senior leaders um, that all, all AI-enabled autonomous systems require senior level reviews depending on uh, the scope of the, of the program um, that are also required in there now. But really, that's the main reg for, for policy. There's not really much else out there telling folks how to do autonomy T&E correctly uh, from a top-down perspective. There is one DAU course, CLE002. I think it's an update right now, but it's just an introduction to uh, T&E of autonomous systems. It provides a baseline, talks about some challenges, talks about some methods, uh, but it's really an introduction level um, that hasn't really evolved too much um, because a lot of these techniques and methods and lessons are emerging still from the field. Um, one open question we, we've sort of been going back and forth on is should we try to put other guidance, non-DOD guidance in our guides uh, like FCC, FAA, you know, if there's, if there's other standards or guides out there, is that, are, are those uh, valuable that people would like pointers to those if they're related to autonomous systems? Um, probably yes. Uh, help us identify those though. <laughs> Uh, because uh, um, it's only through learning and interacting with the programs and projects that are doing this that we learn oh, what, what's important from the FCC or whatever other agency is out there to uh, include in the policy guidance as well. Uh, okay, uh, it's important to realize autonomy is really closely linked to artificial intelligence. And in, when you say artificial intelligence, 99% of people think machine learning. Um, so I like to have a little bit of talk about what's the differences between AI and autonomy, and where do we draw the lines? So autonomy is really talking about um, the ability of a system to do things independently of external control. So it's a delegation of authority, think command and control authority to perform a task, right? It's not how smart is the system or adaptive or anything like that. It's not necessarily, um, doesn't even necessarily have to be on man. You can have autonomous functions or capabilities within our larger systems. But it's the degree of, of, of uh, independence and ability to take action independently of um, some other higher authority or, or supervisor or operator controlling it, right? Okay. Oh, hey. Um, AI, uh, and, and by the way, autonomy is, in, in our context, is usually talking at the system level, right? So integrated system for the most part, or subsystem in some cases. Versus AI is really talking about the building machines to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence as an element in a larger system pursuing a goal. So an AI is think of as a component of a larger system, um, which is going to be usually tested using measure, measures of performance, as opposed to an autonomous system. You're thinking about measures of effectiveness, measures of suitability, some of those overarching uh, higher level measures. Machine learning is a subset of AI right, in which um, uh, the uh, machine is programmed not by expert coding, but by absorbing a ton of data and figuring out its own uh, way to solve something, right? So it's um, a subset of AI techniques. Non-machine learning AI is sometimes called expert AI or rule-based AI or other names, but that is part of AI as well, and it's an important part. Um, but it's important to understand how these all relate to each other because it is so integral that autonomous systems are going to incorporate AI in some ways. Uh, autonomous systems, I sometimes like to say, is AI in motion, right, to differentiate from there's all kinds of AI systems out there being developed that are sort of AI at rest. Think business systems, intelligent systems that are, you know, scanning imagery or whatever they're doing, but they're not actually moving physical things in the real world. Those aren't really autonomous systems, but those are AI-enabled systems. Here's, here's my notional example to talk about how all this kind of ties together. So if we think about a uh, notional autonomous vehicle, all right, in green, it's driving down the road, right? There's trees and traffic and kids running across the road and stoplights and all kinds of things to worry about. So what does the vehicle, if it's autonomous, need to do? It needs to see, essentially hear sirens, horns, other warnings, uh, monitor its own vehicle status. It needs to maintain driving on the roadway. 
It needs to avoid obstacles that may be in or around the roadway. It needs to avoid traffic. Uh, it needs to comply with traffic laws, uh, which may include school zones and construction and other things, right, uh, that pop up. Um, and it needs to navigate to, to its destination. So those are, those are all tasks within the larger mission the autonomous vehicle needs to do. So then um, how does it do that? Again, this is a notional, so overly simplified, but you may have a component of it that's a machine learning AI for computer vision processing, right? That was trained using training data uh, in the past at some point, has an onboard camera, maybe a road database, and it combines that information to recognize the scene it's in. Um, and then that's gonna provide some kind of uh, information about the road, about traffic obstacles, you know, green lights and red light signals and other things to some other component in the system. You may also have a separate piece that's doing your navigation, right? Your, your, uh, your, uh, uh, you know, your route um, kind of thing we all have our, on our iPhones, uh, which probably is taking a road database, maybe taking real-time traffic updates and doing some uh, optimization to get used to where you want to go as fast as possible, okay, with desirable routes. And then that's potentially feeding into a larger AI, which in this case I've got an expert AI, not a machine learning, but you know, uh, there are various ways to probably solve this, but it's gonna prioritize goals and threats to decide what, how I'm actually controlling the vehicle. So it's trying to get you on the route to your destination while taking into account obstacles and traffic and everything else it's seeing, and it's gonna output brakes what, what, and the gas, what are they doing, what's the steering wheel doing, what's the turn signals or other you know, headlights or anything else uh, it might need to operate doing. And it's, so those are the outputs, right? So AI may be components within this system but the whole big dash line around the whole thing is the autonomous system in general in an integrated fashion. So it's integration of hardware and software in the representative environment. Any questions up to here? Okay, I'll probably try to speed up. This is pretty basic. Um, so, oh, is this for you? you can take yeah, it. you got yeah. it. Yeah. All right, Back to I'll, I'll speed up as well. Um, so the background for economy, let me get a mic, thank you. Uh, so the background here is, if you look at traditional programs, there was regulatory guidance historically linked to milestone, uh, and there were things that had to be done by a certain time, and we knew that what they were to make a program. Uh, Section 804, rapid acquisition comes along in 2020, kind of defines some alternative pathways. But what we're seeing is, when you start talking about autonomous systems, emerging technologies, it's something more like exploratory testing, right? They're, they're, they're playing with these things, we're sandboxing them. Um, you're getting value from learning relationships between variables, you're not evaluating against a requirement. You know, these requirements, they're not writing down hard requirements and saying, we'll go say if it meets it, and then if so, we're good. So um, you're now, you're, no, you're more or less playing with these things, uh, but you're informing design trades, knowledge, you know, you're growing knowledge over time as these systems mature. The biggest thing is you are now into an iterative learning process that's going to continue throughout that. And you're going to see this iterative thing, which I don't think anybody argues with, but how does that flow through everything that we're going to be doing from going on here? And how do we deal with that given that we haven't done it before? So the central challenge is it's a paradigm change from the segregated T&E where we all had our own things and we knew what everything had to be done and we knew when it had to be done by. Um, two things that we have hardware, which is going to be changing throughout the time. Coming in, we may be starting with surrogates, uh, hardware may be changed at some cycle, but in essence with these, we're talking about software driven systems. Software is the core of these things. Um, so they're going to be utilizing the sprint development, right? Agile DevSecOps is going to be coming in. And even if it's not called that, it's going to be something very similar to that, where there's going to be multiple passes through the same thing. So the central challenge is how do you do a hybrid approach where you have hardware, you have software, you're going through not test evaluation once, but constantly. T&E is a continuum. We're missing that talk right now. Um, but that's something that our sponsor is very big on and that I think a lot of people are echoing through this. Um, so, you know, and as you, you don't, you're not given a con ops, you're, you're a, it's evolving. The human teaming coordination, evolving. These are all evolving. And one of the interesting things is we're going to talk about, you're going to be going through these processes multiple times. You may not do every step every time, but you need to be aware of them. Um, so just a depiction that things are changing as we, we go, the T&E world, we just say it breaks the T&E paradigm. Um, in the interest of time, I won't really go through these. There are multiple lists. These were um, put in order by the last one. Data, obviously, that's 
That's why we're here. That's the number one thing people are talking about here. Requirements and measures only in that it breaks the paradigm, right? We don't know what to do anymore because we're not given those. Infrastructure and personnel, we need smarter people. We need new places to test these. Um, the next four, three, or four are kind of things that we've identified. Exploitable vulnerability, safety, the simulation is very important, and the human system teaming. So those four kind of lump into the things that we're now evolving. And if you look, and they were ranked like this, but these have to do with, again, this, this T&E con, uh, continuum, but they're never done testing. You have to design from test in the beginning. You, how do you know that it's you know tested adequately? So all of those kind of boil down back into that continuous test loop. Uh, very briefly, we did have the 2022 workshop, and there were eight themes that we brought out there. A lot of senior leadership involvement, um, a lot of experts in the field, uh, about 200 people participated. Um, but yes, number one thing, need for holistic test strategies, continuous agile testing. Um, open architecture, government organizations acting as the prime. We need smart people because the programs that are succeeding are succeeding because of the government people and the government people creating the open architecture. Leaning, looking toward industry is not working on this. It's not going to. Um, but I th there's some amazing work going on at the ground level. And that's what we're trying to capture because I, I think, you know, there, these two particularly, open architecture and the government organizations acting as prime, it, it's, it's been super impressive. Uh, we talked about trust is a well-known thing, safety, test infrastructure. Um, and then seven is where we come in, the ability to collaborate, right? We're all trying to do this at the same time. So we got we to gotta get smart and learn how to talk to each other. Um, and then finally, the pathway to certification, because we don't have the milestones. We don't know when it's good enough and who's going to say it can go do a mission. Um, so uh, as we go through here, we're going to talk about where to begin, uh, briefly go over the stat process, which is something that we kind of use, but how it goes to autonomy. Um, then we're going to talk about an analogy to human operators. If the machines are going to take over things people used to do, let's start with how we used to train and evaluate the people. Let's not throw everything out just because it's new. And I think you'll see that there's a lot of parallels that run through that. So there, there's, we really can kind of look to what we've always done and just say, if you're, if you're going to have a machine do it instead of a person, you're going to have to use some of the same techniques to evaluate and train that machine. Um, and then a holistic look, again, this, it's going to be sequential. We're going to learn new things each time. How do we build that? Um, finally, we'll talk about the specific uh, methods, techniques, um, and uh, hopefully we will have plenty of time to get feedback about expansions, improvements, and anything during this that triggers any thoughts, we're more than welcome to join. Unfortunately, I will not spend the hour that I would love to spend on this, but everybody just needs a structured process, and the introduction of autonomy doesn't break this process. It actually makes it more necessary. Um, I could highlight, I would have a, a wonderful time if you want to grab me afterwards and we can go through. Um, but we're starting typically with now with, with capability, not requirements, right? But the gathering previous information, we're going to talk about this. We're going to be going through these loops over and over. We need to capture what we learned in the first one because people are going to change. Programs are changed. Programs are going to evolve. And I don't think we've done a good job of that traditionally. We just get through, get to the next thing, write the report, move on. There's a lot of knowledge that gets lost. Um, decomposition, we don't have to test everything every time. The, these testable questions, the question is, what do you need to go not to the next one? The very first time out, you're not going to put it in an operational environment. You're going to put it in some lab environment to get it into some sandbox environment. So understanding what those questions are. And we can go through the whole process. But a couple of things to point out is that when you go through, before we start going to test, we have this data analysis plan that tells us what we need to know, how we're going to get it. We want to capture all of this planning that we did into some kind of knowledge base, so it's sitting there for the next person. Um, and then ultimately, as you go through, you come to some decision, which is just as part on the left-hand side indicated, I'm going to go back into a continuum. So in the interest of time, I will leave this here. But um, do you have a comment? Oh, OK. Yep. OK. Um, so uh, the stat process is a process not autonomy specific, but just how you generally evaluate um, systems in general from working for requirements down through uh, analysis of data to make decisions. Um, autonomy brings a lot of differences in. And so how do we attack those from a framework perspective? Um, as mentioned in the beginning, we're replacing 
tasks that humans used to do with a machine doing them now. So it makes a lot of sense every time we have a new missile or a new tank or whatever, we always say, well, at least it has to be as good as the last one, right? That's like the first requirement. It has to shoot at least as far as the last missile did. It has to go at least as fast as the last submarine or whatever, right? Um, so it makes sense to say, well, can the system perform at least as well as a human could? That's a pretty basic question. How do you measure that, though? How do you evaluate that? Uh, what is comparable between a human operator and a machine? Uh, so we're going to look at um, look at a little bit of that just for a moment as a framework for understanding what we need to evaluate uh, from an autonomy perspective. With the end result being that we want the military commander to have confidence when they employ the system, just like we want the commander to have confidence in their people that are they're sending into war, right? We want to have the same kind of confidence in the system that they're sending into war, and they want to understand where the risks are, just like you know, no two people. Are, uh, perform the same, uh, you know, uh, someone's going to have more or less confidence based on the person uh, they're across from and they, when their known capabilities and limitations, you want to understand the capabilities and limitations and the risk involved in these systems as well. Uh, so a large part of my career I was a pilot. So this is going to be a pilot analogy, but you can imagine a similar analogy if you're a submarine operator or a tank driver or whatever. But how do we uh, develop and then evaluate a fighter pilot? Well you start in a small, light civilian plane when you first start training. And you get a bunch of academics on FAA rules and aerodynamics and things. You have closed book exams. You have a training syllabus. You have simulator training that you start with before you actually get in a real airplane. And then you have training aircraft. And you're flying with an instructor uh, sitting beside you. You have ops limits and emergency procedures you have to learn. You have daily debriefs of your performance on every single training mission right, to, to improve and get better. What did you do wrong? What do you need to change for tomorrow? Um, eventually, you're going to have check rides. Eventually, maybe you're going to graduate from a training airplane to a real um, uh, military weapon system. Okay, um, and then you're going to have more training there. And then you're not done. At first, you're a wingman, and then over time, you gain experience. You become a flight lead, and over time, maybe you become a mission commander. Uh, and through all that, you still continue to have daily debriefs and tactics development. And you're going to be training against red air and adversaries on a regular basis to continue imp improving. And when you go to war, you have a specific spin-up usually. Before you go to a specific uh, AOR, um, where you're going to study specific threats that are going to be you know, prevalent in that, in that environment. So it's a whole process um, to build. An autonomous system can, in many ways, be evaluated, tested, or developed in ways that are similar to a human. So probably hard to read. but. I've drawn a parallel between all those things humans have to do and a lot of the things that we're doing with autonomy. Um, so initial development of unmanned systems, uh, uh, formal verification, simulation, surrogate platforms, runtime monitoring. I'm going to talk about all these coming up, okay? So you have to remember, memorize this now. But the point being that many of these things are analogous and they're a way for the, for the new folks to understand how does this all fit together. Well, it kind of fits together the way you build build up training for an operator. We've got to build up the, tr the training and testing of, of the system. Okay, So as we go through the individual methods, we're going to talk about how are they analogous potentially to a human uh, in their training or testing. Okay, um, The caveat on this, um, uh, let the buyer beware, is that there are a lot of similarities and parallels. This is mainly intended to just be analogy, right, to make it easier to understand and fit together. They're not one to one the same thing, so you can't, you know, think, well, I know what you know this is, and therefore I know what autonomy. No, it, these are all different, but it's just intended to inform and educate on on how we're going to do this. Um, the last part of where to begin, um, Dave Scheidt is a is a former Navy guy um, who's done a lot of autonomy T and E, and he's got some, a couple great papers on this. So I want to point to some of his stuff for where to begin as well. He talks about how autonomy is different because um, the way we evaluate information with autonomy is going to be different. Um, when we're talking about how something is making a decision, some of this goes into like decision theory, um, you've got lots of, of uh, different factors or, or, or qualities of the decision. It's not just you know, how complex of a decision is it and how quality of a decision then, given that complexity, but, but if you're making a decisions in real time in a, in a changing scenario, how quickly you can make a decision in a dynamic environment may affect greatly how good is that decision or, or how useful is that decision. Um, are things adapting or learning through the environment, right? Then that's going to affect the decision-making process and the system learning. If there's random events, 
uh, obviously there's, there's going to be statistics involved. If there's adversaries, you know, some would say the statistics aren't relevant because you can't uh, go off of what you've seen in the past when you have a thinking adversary. Um, so those are some factors involved in the overall test and evaluation of autonomous system. The OODA loop is something the military is, is largely familiar with, observe, uh, orient, decide, and act. And autonomous systems, just like people in, in a combat situation, are going to be going through an OODA loop where they're observing their environment, orienting to what's happening, deciding what to do, and acting in the same way. So that's a good model for how autonomous systems are going to interact in the environment by themselves, interact with operators, also human teamed in that environment, or interact between other autonomous systems as well. So lots of interactions there that make this a lot more complicated as well. Um, and the, yeah, the information paradox here, like I kind of said, uh, you want as much information as possible before you make a decision, but the longer it takes to make a decision, sometimes the worse it is because speed matters. Um, so, that, so, uh, so there's a, a paradox there. Um, another overarching model of how do we evaluate autonomy um, from sort of beginning to end is to realize there are lots of pieces here that build up to an assurance case. One of the last, the, the keynote panel was talking about assurance cases or assurance. Um, and the idea being that there's not just one big operational test at the end that's going to say, yep, it's good to go, like let's field it, right? It's going to be a whole body of evidence that's built up over a long time to build an argument that this thing is, is safe and effective to use. Um, it goes all the way back to, to requirements. There's going to be things like formal validation, formal verification, formal methods for different pieces of the system. Some things are going to be only validated or verified in simulation. Uh, there's a lot of code and software issues here. You're going to do um, uh, hardware in the loop, another simulation base and holistic assessments before you finally take something out on a range and either fly it or you know swim it in in open water, so that kind of thing um, to get to operational validation. So this is a long process, and that building up the evidence and passing on what you've learned throughout the entire process is sort of the uh, overarching takeaway here. All right, so now we're going to get into the individual methods. Any questions up to this point on sort of, this has all been sort of top level background up to here. We're going to get more detail now. Anything on chat? OK. All right, so uh, as we go through the methods, we sort of bucketed them into what phase of your program uh, do these sort of go in. It's not always clean. Sometimes things cross boundaries, but this is how we've done it for this briefing today. Um, so we're starting with acquisition and development strategy, which isn't really a test process at all. But there are things that happen during uh, that phase which will greatly affect how the T&E can, can be done. So we're going to talk about things that are useful in that phase. And then we're going to go through test strategy, test planning, design, execution, data analysis, uh, and then certification and accreditation. Uh, so talking about acquisition and development strategy, here's the seven things that we're going to talk about on the next seven slides. All right, and these are all going to look pretty similar. but We've got the description overall on the left, uh, analogous to human training, intended results, best practices, what challenges are addressed, how the method benefits, test evaluation, and then if there's any limitations or assumptions or cost involved, right? Um, so operational modeling, what is this? This is providing a model of the desired system behavior in an operational context. It's similar to a use case. The, the, the issue here being that, unlike past systems where you have a requirements document which says, you know, the gun shall shoot within two seconds of pulling the trigger. Uh, when you have an autonomous system operating continuously in an environment on its own, you, you can't really write those kind of hard and fast and easily measurable requirements. A lot of times you have more of a use case, um, which is you know, more of a software thing, um, that you're going off of how it's supposed to respond and behave in a scenario. Okay, how is this analogous to human uh, training, early ground training? Um, it usually has cl classroom academics on the fundamentals to understand the flying environment, basic aerodynamic principles, FAA rules, things like that, um, that you have to have as the background of, of how are you supposed to behave before you get out in the field, right? Um, the intended results here being that if we do good operational modeling of the system early on, then system developers and t and &E practitioners both are going to understand the desired and undesired system behaviors in a much better way. Uh, best practice being, uh, using accepted world models and accepted state models to accurately and comprehensively define system states that match operating modes and phases with their actual operational environments they're going to be operated in. This addresses challenges and requirements and measures, test adequacy and integration, um, and it's going to you know, basically lead to those human tasks like perception, reasoning, decisions, 
uh, being based upon correct, consistent, and logical uh, use of, of the modeling that was involved uh, to the scenarios that you were expecting to see in the use cases, okay? So that everything's consistent, precise, and traceable back to uh, a mission impact. So this um, operational modeling as part of the you know, development and strategy, that's kind of a, a paradigm shift from how government does, um, you know, all, like you were talking about, like setting requirements, like yeah. that's very different. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested to see, so the, and the idea is that the test will match the use case that's modeled. Um, but there, I, I could see a situation where maybe the test case, like it does everything it says it does, but maybe it also ends up doing some other stuff and is that good or bad? And um, I guess I, I'm interested to see how that, um, what, what that looks, what that looks like when it, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, testing and evaluating. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so the question was um, about um, if you're going off of use cases, then sort of it's sort of easy to test, you know, did your test match your use case, but when you have other factors or other surprises that happen that maybe weren't planned out in that use case, how do you deal with those, I think, to rephrase it? Um, that's a good question. I don't have a good answer for that other than to say some of our later stuff might address that in in how we do runtime assurance and 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 cognitive instrumentation and some of the other things we're going to get to later, um, which will which I think will help address that concern a little bit. Um, uh, but yeah, otherwise I I think that's one of the fundamental things about autonomy that sort of everybody recognizes is a concern and a a worry is what undesirable behavior is this thing going to have that we didn't plan for? You know, and that's why we, we have to do the testing and why we have to do these certain case card arguments and all that. So I, I don't know. That probably doesn't answer, but. From like, from like a policy point, point of view. So like when does that decision get made that, okay, these extra things, they're okay or they're not okay? Like at what point in the process is that? I mean, that's going to depend, I'm sure, right, on on what are we talking about, what's the risk level, and how easy is it to fix or not, and you know, I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't have a good answer. Um, so if you get a good answer to that, share it with the rest of us, and we'll, you know, we'll add it, right? <laughs> okay, uh, next up, um, small scale development. So. Uh, analogy, analogy to humans. Again, you know, the human pilot starts in a little Cessna, right, when you first start to fly, and you, you learn there. And if you can't fly that, then, you know, you get kicked out of pilot training, and you're not going to be a pilot. Uh, it's the same kind of thing with autonomy. We want to develop autonomy in small, uh, um, cheap, easy to uh, replace, and well understood assets at first. And that way, it speeds your development because you can make a lot of progress on something cheap and easy, and then transfer all that to something more complicated later. Um, so using Cheap, simple platforms, uh, speed development, and then scaling up. Um, and result being that we make progress as, as cheaply, safely, quickly, and efficiently as possible. Best practice, we want to make sure that we're documenting what we did with the small scale assets and the learning that, that can reduce risk later uh, to speed acceptance by the authorities that need to accept that result later. That's it, addressing challenges like safety, data, requirements, measures, testing, continuum. Um, yeah, I think I've basically already said all the rest of this. Uh, a, a assumption that the small scale asset can realistically test or realistically represent the intended uh, system under test in a useful way, right? That there's always going to be some transfer issues or some uh, negative learning that could potentially happen because you're you're not in your in intended situation uh, that you're ending. Sir, so on that on that exact point, um, these systems tend to have especially AI-based economy, tends to have like emergent properties that only come out at certain scales. So you won't even know necessarily what, what you're missing until you do scale up. And then you could have these like secondary or tertiary things that like just emerge and undermine the whole. Yeah, agreed. Um, so I, I, you know, I, again, that's a challenge, right? Is identifying uh, where is there risk residual risk, and where is their transition risk? Um, 
uh, you know, again, as a pilot, when you when you first fly your trainer and then you switch airplanes, sometimes landing your handles in a different spot or the switch that you know does whatever is in a different spot, and you you're not thinking you flipped the wrong switch because you know, right? That that same kind of thing with autonomy that some things are going to carry over and some aren't, and it's it's going to take testing or expertise or both to identify those and and identify what do we need to retest, you know, where does the risk still lie that we haven't solved. I hear that. I think in when this is stuff is communicated to people who don't know autonomy and AI as well, it's important to highlight that this can have emergent properties that, for instance, like a changing planes when you're learning in pilot school, like those are going to be differences, but they're they're not the same. They're not the same type of threat that emergence is, um, and that people are aware that, that is a limitation. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So yeah, I think you're and you're right. So we 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 probably need to make sure that our limitations and costs and assumptions on all these are really clear. Um, absolutely, it's sort of the pitfalls, and and those are the lessons learned that again we're trying to highlight for the community. Okay, open architecture. So open architecture is a big buzzword, been around for a while. What are we talking about? Using non prepared pre pre non proprietary. Open architecture standards for integrating subsystems and services into a mission package with the government-owned interface. Okay, why is this important for T&E? This doesn't seem like a T&E thing. It actually helps T&E a lot because um, you can uh, use standardized uh, test tools and standardized instrumentation and standardized data analysis methods if you have a standardized open architecture system, right? It helps the tester to have expectations about how the system is put together and how it's communicating internally. Uh, so this is again analogous, like kind of like we said a second ago, to um, an operator being able to transfer between different types of aircraft and still operate, you know, effectively, um, and basically gain proficiency quicker uh, in, in that way. Um, an example is UMAA, which somebody mentioned in a brief yesterday, unmanned maritime autonomy architecture. Uh, the Air Force has OMA, their Open Mission Architecture. We can also be talking about architectures for simulation, like AFSIM, or the Navy is developing NATS, the Naval Autonomous Test System, I think it's called, which is intended to be a, a government-owned simulation architecture for, for simulation um, of operational missions for autonomous systems. Um, so this has a lot of benefits uh, in the test realm as well. Uh, and that's all that we're trying to point out, point out here through having better insight and then portable instrumentation and, and test methods and measures and processes that can be reused between systems. Automated requ requirements. This isn't really analogous to human training in any way, but we're talking about maybe uh, using automated tools to translate English language requirements into logical code. Uh, we throw this out there because NASA's uh, done a lot of work in this area with their autonomy stuff. Um, so the idea is that we have clear, concise, accurate test objectives traced directly from uh, requirement statements. Um, and using standardized form formats enables that to remove and minimize ambiguity in what the system's supposed to do. Uh, so there's some tools that do, do this, like FRET from NASA, Form Requirements Elicitation Tool, uh, with the idea being that um, you know, it's going to be easier to make sure that the, how the system operates aligns with the requirements if they're um, uh, automated and translated into uh, measurable um, agents or artifacts uh, uh, that, that feed your test objectives in your test process then. Continuous testing, there's been a bunch of, of talk about this in DOD, but this is testing throughout the development process and the entire system operational life cycle. Uh, analogous to humans, again, of you, you never stop training as an operator. You're, you're training all the time. You're always trying to get better and going to war. Um, so uh, the intended result being that we have, you know, timely and accurate T&E that responds to variable uh, and continuous improvement and, and adaptation of, and upgrading of these systems. So agile processes, DevOps or DevSecOps processes, I've even heard the word Dev TestOps, since we're testers, right? Uh, processes where you're building testing and operator involvement into the development process uh, for having a pipeline for continuous uh, testing, continuous integration, continuous delivery of capabilities. Um, the best practice on this is to try to use obviously automated uh, software integration and regression testing um, as much as possible so that it's all seamless um, and, and, and uh, timely 
uh, delivery um, of updates. And rail, uh, the rapid autonomy integration lab is, is what the Navy is working on as sort of their uh, best practice of trying to stand up an example of a, of a software pipeline uh, that's agile and continuous like this. Um, okay, code isolation. Another kind of one-off one, but um, the idea here is using a code development framework that enables code isolation for safety and security. So um, not really analogous to humans again, but the idea here is that um, if you have all your software for your autonomous system built on the same uh, platform, then when you make a little you know, non-critical change, you have to potentially retest the entire software package uh, because you've got safety critical and mission critical software mixed in the same platform where you're compiling your your human interface code or your, you know, I don't know, whatever data link, maybe you change some data link parameters or something. The idea here is that by isolating and separating what, how you do development to safety critical systems or, or secure systems or mission critical systems being actually developed and compiled on different isolated platforms, that, that eases testing a lot because you don't have to go back and get approval and do a bunch of safety regression testing potentially on your flight control software or whatever other mission critical safety software is involved if you're just making a minor software change with an interface or something like that. So, so again, this is sort of an acquisition strategy type of uh, practice that can really help testers um, in the long run. Uh, okay, and then assurance cases. So there's been talk about this before, but what is an assurance case? A structure argument supported by evidence to justify the system's excessively assured uh, uh, relative to a specific safety concern, like safety, or to a concern like safety or security or something else in the operating environment. Um, thanks. Uh, so, you know, what, what's the result of an assurance case? It's a persistent, dynamic justification to establish assurance of a system uh, versus your critical concerns by using a combination of test results. Um, be they from you know integrated system level results to subsystem or or component level results, lab results, monoglot simulation results, formal verification, formal methods, which isn't really testing at all. It's like it's a, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, and leveraging all that as evidence uh, to make an assurance case argument, and a, and usually that's depicted in some kind of you know breakdown hierarchy flowchart. Um, if you haven't seen those before, um, where you have an overarching statement of assurance and then you have different uh, underlying arguments that support that with different facts uh, that are evidence-based from your testing or, or other uh, sources. Um, so the benefit here being that we're, we're, we're trying for a holistic system assurance based off all sources, um, and, and we're trying to efficiently and effectively integrate all that to uh, address concerns. Um, the cost here is that it takes time to set up the assurance case. You need expertise to, to run an assurance case um, and to understand where information is going to fit together. Um, and then, you know, you have limitations about how do you weight the value of evidence from different sources. Uh, not all evidence is going to be created equal. Um, so there's, there's some, some, some challenges uh, with implementing as well. There are some tools. SAFE um, is from TRMC, and we got a slide later on the tools as well for more detail. Uh, that they've developed, uh, and then there's some other tools like NASA and Google have tools for assurance case arguments if you're interested. Okay, I'm gonna hand it to Lenny for a bit. Any questions on any of those up to there that we didn't cover? So I'm gonna do a little bit of an audible. I think we're running late. I wanna make sure we have time at the end. Sure. We got about, and you're not gonna be late for lunch, right? So priorities. Um, one of the things is on each of these slides, we're, we have a slide here. In the book, there's a, there's a longer, description, there's places to go, there's more information on it. So it, it's not, it's, it's definitely a little more in depth there. Um, I'm going to go through these next about 30 slides very quickly, just so that you see what's in there. But as you go through, see if these are things, if you have any things, you know, comments to add, we'll have some time for discussion. Um, so those were, you know, the kind of unique getting it into the acquisition, but for test strategies, um, I'm going to do it from here. LVC testing, right? We've seen this, but there's a write-up on it, depending on the person's level of knowledge, what they may know. Um, surrogate platforms, that was mentioned earlier, but it's a big one. And there's actually some, some real examples from programs where they've used them, where they've seen the advantages um, from those. Formal verifications, right? It's great if you can do it, but there's pros and cons on that one, right? One and done if you get it right. Otherwise, when the complexity comes up, that the systems don't don't you know avail themselves to that software pedigree evaluation 
Um, again, there's a cost to doing it up front, but if you're doing it, the software, just like when you have things that are approved for government use, right? It makes it easier. You can get through faster. You kind of got to decide early on, are we going to go through and, and get a pedigree on this and get certification so that we know that there's certain things. Maybe we have, we do a little more upfront work, but we can reuse it as we go through. Um, so again, slides on each of these, um, but we got about five minutes to get to the wrap up. So is that okay, Charlie? 12:20, but you've got about 15 minutes at the end, and then some discussion. I think so. Um, uh, methods for addressing challenges with test planning, um, training data sets, right? For for managing machine language, um, and and I'll just I'll kind of go through so we can at least see some of these. Um, we're, we're familiar with these management schemes for operational scenarios and ensure training, validation, and testing, right? It's getting the data, knowing, you have, having the data, using it, um, holding some out, and making sure the data is representative of your operational situations. Um, stat, one of the things we talked about is you go through the process multiple times. We like to do the designs for when you have complex spaces, you need to evaluate performance. That's not the first time through on these things. They're going to be demonstrations. Things, things, these things don't apply to that. Okay, they're going to say, now, don't, now we want to do a demonstration, but we show it in two cases, right? That's what they need at the time. But we like to be around because there are a point where you're going to start talking about performance, and it's into that continuum again. Each time you, you go to design a test, you're going to have different objectives. They're not all going to require high-level analytics, but they are at some point. So having those people on the team and just thinking about it iteratively, growing it. Adversarial trusting, we've talked about this a lot, um, getting it up and deciding how to do it and getting people trained and getting, again, being exposed to, exposed to it, very important um, as part of that. But again, you're not going to do adversarial testing your first day out on the range. Um, operational mission testing, right? So when you do get to these things, you want to have a lot of things knocked off so that you're testing the unknown unknowns. Uh, building this into the strategy, we kind of talk about this uh, into the realistic conditions and integrated when you have the, you know, with the men and the other support, but it's something that you're going to build up to. Again, as you see, there's already multiple layers of going through testing the same things over and over. Uh, post acceptance testing. Again, when are you done testing with an, uh, an emerging technology AI autonomous system, right? We monitor these things. We monitor people every day. There's a debrief. We're, that's just going to be a paradigm change that we're going to have to have. We're going to have to have people in the programs. We're going to have to have career fields potentially, but we're going to have to have ways to handle this, ways to handle the data ways to get that fed back in, and then how are you going to update the system? So there's a lot there in post-acceptance testing, which, um, you know, uh, again, and then get people aware of that, but then how does that feel, fit into your whole program as you go through? Um, challenges uh, addressed with text execution. You want to go through? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, test execution, some, some challenges as well. We're going to go through cognitive interpretation. So what is this? This is the idea that you need insight as a tester into the internal workings of an AI-enabled system or an autonomous system um, to understand how and why it's making a decision, where it, which is going to require some interpretation, potentially, to gather the data and capture it so that you can analyze it appropriately, right? So um, this is analogous to, again, an operator learning throughout their career. Every, every training mission, you're going to go back, you're going to watch the tapes, you're going to uh, go over what happened in the mission, what went wrong, what could have gone better. It's that same kind of mentality. Um, the uh, intended result being we want to identify root causes of deficiencies in performance. Um, with the idea being that sometimes a system is going to have a problem or make an error, and it's going to be based on bad code. But sometimes it's going to be based on bad hardware, something broke in a sensor, or something broke otherwise in the hardware. Sometimes if it's an ML system, it may be that the training data was ina inadequate in some way. Um, so there, or, or the algorithm was in, inadequate in some way. So there are a myriad of potential causes for why something doesn't perform well. You can't get to the root cause of what really caused that deficiency to occur unless you understand all the inputs it was using to make a decision and how it made the decision it did. Um, so that you have because so that you have the information on that. Uh, so the idea is you, you, cognitive instrumentation is going to help you diagnose those causes um, and understand the inner workings. Uh, obviously, there are costs involved because you have to design that in from the beginning to implement uh, the cognitive instrumentation within the system framework. Um, ICOS from NASA is one uh, software tool that does this. There, there are others being built. 
uh, by others. Runtime assurance. So runtime assurance is a little bit controversial. Some like it, some don't, but it's the idea as a pilot that you're flying with an instructor who, if you mess up or don't know what to do, can take over the controls and safely get you back to base or land or otherwise provide help um, if, you, if you need it while you're in flight. So it's the same kind of thing with an autonomous system that you're gonna automate safety and security reporting um, using runtime monitoring and feedback tools to manage risk and, and allow for some graceful degradation. Uh, so it, it provides a backup for safe recovery of the vehicle, un unanticipated problems occur, or maybe you just need to restart your AI, right? And, and to, so to have sort of an overarching safety system that can control the vehicle or platform while you're resetting your system under test um, provides a lot of usefulness um, uh, in, in having efficiency and effectiveness in your test missions. Um, cost, obviously the, uh, it, it, it's an extra layer of, of stuff to set up and test and implement and integrate when you're, when you're integrating your system. Um, and then the runtime assurance system itself has to be VNV'd so you trust it. Um, so there's, there's some burden there as well. Uh, but CASE, which is TRMC funded and Johns Hopkins uh, has developed, um, is, is an airborne runtime assurance system um, that's out there and, and it's still in development and improvement. Um, R2U2 from NASA is a software-based one for uh, available for use as well, and there are others, I'm sure, uh, that we're not aware of. Layered runtime monitoring. This idea is that um, because we're going to test our systems at various locations with various safety protocols, from early lab testing through developmental testing through operational testing, and you don't have the same range safety um, capabilities in all those places uh, that that you probably one size fits all runtime assurance isn't going to potentially work in all situations. So this idea is that if you have multiple layers of runtime assurance, then when you move to a different location or a different situation where certain safety protocols aren't available, you can remove that, you know, one layer of runtime assurance, but you still have some others in the background or, or elsewhere in your um, sort of nested uh, architecture of assurance that are still going to be um, uh, providing some monitoring and some assurance in the case of, of failure um, uh, so you, you don't lose lose your mission or lose your, your asset. Um, obviously there's cost in, in setup implementation of that as well. Um, uh, but you can imagine that you know uh, some some OT tests or you know uh, post post fielding tests you're not going to have the same kind of safety requirements or capabilities um, as you would in, in early testing. Trust measures, so there was a little bit of talk about this yesterday in one of the talks. Um, calibrating uh, measures of human operators or, or human commanders' trust and confidence in the system is, is important. Um, the idea being that, you know, just for when, like, when humans deploy, the commanders have to be confident in their capabilities and different individuals are gonna have different capabilities that, that that need to be understood, right? And, and not only that, but operators are gonna grow in their experience and they're gonna be given more trust over time. So, so the idea here as well is, is to have measures to understand for commanders and operators how much they should trust it. It's not that you want to always trust it. There are cases where you don't wanna trust it. So how you calibrate and match the trust given to the system with this, what the trust system deserves to be trusted in is the challenge here, right? So there are some measures that have been developed in the ST community for that and trying to get those out to the community, um, uh, like toast, those kind of things, um, essentially to, to make sure that we understand the risk when we're deploying systems. Um, there, there are limitation assumptions here uh, that the human trust measures are, are really still in development. These aren't pull them off the shelf and they're good to go. There, there's still a lot of um, research being done about what are the best ways to measure trust and what are the different types of trust and, and how do we do this. It's not certainly not solved. So this is one that's got a lot of interest and we're still gonna continue to develop moving forward. Um, data analysis. So uh, just a couple here. Uh, these are more uh, stat uh, kind of things that maybe people in this room are familiar with, maybe not. Um, <clears throat> automated outlier search and boundary testing. So the idea here being that you have quick uh, and efficient means of determining your test points to get to um, those edge cases in your, in your test region. Right, um, the you know analogous to an operator understanding you know what's their G limit, what's their engine limits, what their what are their flight control limits, and those kind of things. An, an autonomous system is going to have its own limits, um, but we're not always going to be able to predict those uh, successfully 
uh, just based on the, you know, the initial design and modeling. Um, so there are ways to do iterative testing and adaptive testing, which will quickly determine where the safe zones are and then uh, help determine where the boundaries are of effective or, or efficient or safe operations um, based on maybe some non-linearities non in how the system responds um, that you can do, do. Some tools wrapped uh, from TRMC, uh, I think was talked about yesterday in one of the briefs, uh, Ring adversarial planning tool. Um, a great tool for that, requires some high computing. Boundary Explorer is another similar tool that works with Jump, which is a desktop-based tool. It doesn't have the same people as Wrap does, but it's, it's another solution uh, for testers out there. Margins has an, is a NASA version of these um, as well. So those are some, some software tools that can help with that. Failure path testing, very similar, um, but just search, searching for conditions to cause unexpected failure. Um, uh, and, th and then can be automated to, again, efficiently um, determine those uh, by finding combinations of inputs and conditions that might be um, uh, hard to otherwise find without doing exhaustive um, sort of, you know, uh, uh, testing. Um, and it does that by exposing faults and working backwards through how did you get to that fault in a systematic way. Um, so. Riot is the TRMC version that they're developing, robust inside out testing tool. Add a stress is a NASA tool uh, for those, um, uh, which can help with that. Okay, human operator performance uh, standards. So as mentioned earlier, you know, can it perform at least as well as a human did? Sometimes when we're trying to evaluate a system, we don't really have a measure metric. The idea here is if there's a human measure, it was used in training. I mean, you can directly uh, apply that in some cases. So, you know, for an aircraft, there's a you know how closely how you intercept and maintain a course. You know, as a student pilot, that's published. You know, that you should do it this fast and with this degree of precision and that kind of thing, right? So we can directly apply some of those standards. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. They should be acceptable uh, for the machine. Um, but the idea here is that we want to have insight into you know how well is it performing. And can we compare it to a human operator um, as ways of, of uh, evaluating the systems? And if we're using accepted standards, that you know, makes it that much easier. Um, the assumption being that a human standard does exist and it's relevant. Sometimes it's not going to exist or not be relevant, you know, depending what, what task you're talking about. And then some, some human standards are more subjective. So again, as a pilot, at the end of a mission, you get graded on things like judgment and airmanship and flight discipline. Those aren't really <laughs> objectively measurable. They're more like your instructor's opinion of you know how well you did today, right? So we're gonna. I, I I will argue that we want to have those kind of measures for autonomous systems, but how we define them is going to be a challenge. Um, so that's work that's still ongoing and to be done. Uh, certification and accreditation. That's the last one. I think we're okay on time, Lenny. Um, we can skip some of the stuff at the end. Um, so task-based certification. Um, again, the traditional waterfall t and &E process is contractor develop it, they give it to, to DT, there's some changes, right? And then uh, systems sort of ready to go to OT, and then you hand it over to OT, and they do some operational testing on it, and then they say, yep, uh, we're going to buy you know, a thousand of them and, and field them. Um, uh, and, and, and we certify them as, as being good, and it's a one-time event. That is probably not going to happen with autonomy, right? It's going to be a continuous process where we are certifying systems uh, for limited operation of specific tasks, probably, right? And that list of tasks that we trust it to do is going to grow over time as our understanding of the system grows over time and the system capabilities and software um, uh, improves over time, right? So. Uh, which is a, a lot more again, again analogous to how a human is trained. Is you know you don't immediately graduate from tech school and then become you know a trusted general, right? There's a lot of steps in between there. Uh, so um, the idea here is that we want to we want to match standards and match certifications with specific uh, performance and suitability for specific tasks in a mission, and then evolve as those e capabilities evolve, and as T and E methods evolve as well to understand uh, how well the system is performing. Um, with the idea being here, it's going to you know, give a better risk understanding for the operator and the commander of what the system can and can't do, 
uh, with confidence, and, and you'll be able to tailor how you employ and deploy it to match specific scenarios, specific threats, and environments uh, in a much more appropriate uh, way. And then you know, understand also where you're going to need to retrain or retest or subsequently add, add additional certifications later. Uh, I think this is the last one. So um, humans have a learning curve, right? Um, uh, of how we learn and we start off slow and we learn something and then we kind of get it and you learn fast and then you know you kind of taper off at some point where you 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 know uh, you plateau in your skills and something um, a autonomous systems are probably going to have something similar uh, another analogy is a reliability growth curve which a lot of us maybe are familiar with other systems where uh, reliability of a system is expected to grow over time, right? As the system matures and improves, and as we continue to gather test data on how the system's doing um, operationally. So, the idea here is um, you can apply that from an autonomy uh, perspective to quanti quantify various types of risk, um, use statistical techniques similar to reliability growth, um, and address deficiencies. So, the, my idea here being that. Um, there's not a one-size-all-fits-all deficiency, but you might have, you know, major safety critical deficiencies that you track on one growth curve, and you need you expect to see very rapid uh, removal of those and a very low rate, you know, if you're going to continue the program at all, right? And then you might have some sort of medium level deficiency where, okay, it's causing some mission failures, but it's not unsafe, and then we're not losing, throwing away money here. Um, and, and, and you have a different growth curve expected on those. And then maybe you have some minor deficiencies, right, that are kind of like things that are nice and the operators would like to see or did this how, not quite how we would like it, but, but it didn't really affect uh, the overall outcome of the mission. It just made it maybe cost more or take longer or that kind of thing, right? So you may have various different levels of deficiency here that you're tracking as a tester or program manager over time. Um, and, you, and you have different growth curves for and different acceptable growth curves for because it's based on sort of the, the seriousness of the deficiency involved. Um, so, so I've had programs say, well, we don't understand how we're going to prove that we're making progress. It's like, well, here, you know, here's a way. You can prove that you're making progress to your, to your sponsors and your commanders over time. Um, so there's, there's some books that debate challenges to assume this will apply to at least AI systems. Um, because right, these are especially learning curves that are based on human psychology and how, how we work. Sure. Generally, generalize. Um, I mean, the idea of like if we ever get an AGI, sure, we'll generalize, but we don't. Um, and they'll much more likely be seen things like punctuated equilibrium curves, which are not particularly good for proving things in programs. Um, so, like, uh, individual components might have learning curves like this, but mm -hmm. as a system as a whole, it's, it's going to be a lot. It's going to be messy to an extent. I'm not sure how you. I'm sure you're, you're probably correct. I, I mean, I, I, I think my, um, my take is that you're going to have individual subsystems that are individually having their tasks involved, and this is going to be tracked in, in their own way. But you know, usually you're going to have some roll up, right, of, of how are we doing as a whole and all the subsystems and, and in general. And so if there's a way to track as a whole how is the system improving, you know, you, it, it's one way to try to do that. Uh, understanding that you're comparing apples to oranges, then sometimes I guess, right? But, um, but when you're trying to, you know, this is this is sort of about data visualization and and translating test data to useful information for a decision maker, right? And 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 so it's a way to at least present it in a way that they're familiar with, and to say a, a way that we're making progress and how quickly we're making progress potentially, right? Um, that, that's where I think the value is, uh, and I'm sure there are nuances where. Uh, I think it's more because a human is going to usually interpolate these things and see them as smooth lines and like we plateau. Oh or yeah. Whatever. But right. of course, like complicated <clears throat> equilibriums work with discontinuities, right? So you're not going to have these nice plateaus of like we've, we've achieved this level. And, yeah. To be fair, I think the reliability. So we're using the reliability growth curve as the analogy to the uh, human learning. And the reliability growth curves do more follow that sort of punctuated equilibrium pattern. Um, so, uh, I'm not not flat out stating myself that oh yes, of course it's it, it's it's applicable. But like uh, the now the the one that's being presented here at the bottom is more applicable than the psychology based curve that that's.
that first picture up there. Uh, let me caveat everything I've said today with, I'm not trying to tell you this is the answer. I'm trying to give you some helpful suggestions to things you can do to sort of move the ball forward and, and have more effective tests and have more effective analysis certification. So um, there's no claim that this is the right way to do it. This is just a way to do it. And we are all ears for if there's better ways out there. So, all right, we're almost out of time. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take two okay. minutes. Okay, talk about the test ranges, go ahead. Um, one of the things about this is we are not the experts in the guide. We will point you to the experts in the guide. So that's, that's another takeaway is that this will not be the definitive. This will be the start of your search. So, um, yeah, so we did include ranges. I'm going to, I'm just going to fly through these, uh, army test and evaluation command. They have some really cool stuff, hardware in the loop. They have a, a SEER environment. Um, when we have more time, people can kind of look through these Carter rock. These will be in there. I think as a, ideas they would keep their own pages up so as mm -hmm. they have new capabilities they would bring it to bear if somebody says hey i have a new capability we're like boom please give us all your information so so we can gather this in the beginning but we want to make it available have some links to them links to their stuff so you can see what other people are doing because this this is a very rapid growing area it is an infrastructure test capability sandboxes are exploding if you go across here, so there's NRL, there's PMS 406 with the rail. Here's other ones that we're still getting more information on in terms of their capabilities. But I think that's very important for people to understand what's out there so that they can um, you know, know that they're not alone on this. And the uh, same thing is to see what other people have implemented because a, a huge explosion in that area. Yeah, and then just real quick on the tools. We don't have time and we want to let you guys have questions, but um, we're, we're trying to put in our guide where you can find these tools and a, some top level assessment of them to help you decide if you it's worth your time to go look at them or not. So for example, R2U2 is a NASA uh, runtime assurance tool and we're trying to include information about like what architecture it uses, how, how it works, what time architecture it uses, some other features of it, what limitations it might have as far as, you know, okay, this doesn't have a GUI and, you know, maybe is there a cost? Most of these are free because they're government owned, but sometimes, you know, there might be, um, and then some little bit about ease of use as far as what it's compatible with or that kind of thing. So th this is our idea of trying to, to, to have some pointer to what are some tools available uh, and where can you find them. So um, we don't have this built for this brief on, on every single tool, but we just sort of have a list of them. So TRMC has a whole toolkit. Uh, the first couple tools here are completed, wrapped in Riot. I talked about this earlier a little bit. The rest of these are still in development. Uh, Mimic, Safe, Ice T, Bast. Uh, but um, we've got on here sort of, you know, which method does it apply to as far as failure path testing or quantified risks or LVC or whatever. Um, and then some description of them. Um, and this is all in your materials if you want to look at them later. DARPA has a whole Assured Autonomy Toolkit. This is a bunch of other software tools which, which have been developed and are, are freely available. So they've got things for formal verification, simulation, quantifying risk, assurance case, adversarial testing. Um, and then NASA and other places. So we, we have our Boundary Explorers, a stat COE built tool from our office, um, AFRL, uh, Center of Naval Analysis, and then NASA Ames has done, done, done a bunch of stuff. But we haven't looked at a bunch of commercial stuff, but there are things like at Google and other commercial places as well that are available. If we have uh, tools or um facilities to add to the list, who do we contact? Yes, please. We, we want to, again, our whole view is we want to be open arms and capture everything that's potentially useful to a test org or a test program manager or something like that. So uh, you can talk to me or Lenny afterward or, or our emails are in the, in the thing, I think, so. I've got a question online. Uh, it says, human systems teaming is often listed as one of the challenges addressed. Why? Is it because this is a big problem or because there are a lot of ways to address this challenge? Okay, so yeah, the question was about human teaming and why is this a challenge? Is it, um, uh, is it how we address it or is it not addressed or that kind of thing? Um, I think human teaming is a really important challenge that a lot of senior leaders are focused on. This is my opinion, by the way. This is not, you know. Um, but it's a, a challenge that is going to be different in every case, in every unit, in every scenario, in every mission, in every platform. 
there's, there's not going to be a one size fits all. How is the human going to team with the machine on this? It's, it's always going to depend on the mission. It's always going to depend on the specific solutions involved. And so it's, it's, it's probably very, very difficult to define standardized metrics and standardized test processes or, or, or ways to measure how well are we doing human teaming. Um, so I, I, that would be how I would say it's a, it's a challenge and it's a challenge of major concern. Um, there are, the Army is leading the way on this, I will say. Um, uh, Army Research Lab has probably the most, done the most down the road on uh, human teaming measures and, 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 and how the soldier integrates and responds with autonomy in their, in their training environments and combat environments. Um, so I can point you guys to some human teaming experts that are a lot smarter than me on this. Um, uh, that's, uh, I don't know if that answers it, but yeah. I would say it's very broad and I think each of those methods handle a piece of it, but they're not the one, the all answer. Yep. Okay. Two more minutes. Uh, there's a lexicon in our guidebook. The intent is if somebody doesn't know what supervised learning is or, you know, some other, uh, AI or autonomy related term, it's a place to at least look it up. The, a lot of these terms don't have authoritative DOD de definitions. So where we found a definition of some other DOD reg, we try to use that definition. If not, we try to look for the most accepted definition from industry or elsewhere uh, for some of these terms. Uh, future related topics, we don't really have time for this, but as a stat guy, um, I think this isn't an AI brief, but AI is integral to autonomy. So how we evaluate AI, AI is really important. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for future analysis of AI in how we analyze the data being used to train AI because an AI is just as smart as the data used to train it. So really we should be looking at what at the data a lot more in depth with a with a design of experience type of of uh, breakdown of, of factors involved and, and levels um, to really understand how AI is working and that's gonna directly translate to how well autonomy performs. Um, and then we talked about the OODA loop earlier. There are a ton of other issues related to the OODA loop, all phases of the OODA loop when, it, when we start thinking about how machines are going to do this, that it gets really complicated. So the point of this is just that we have a lot of work on a lot of these specific small boxes that surround the OODA loop and, and different challenges and situations where uh, autonomy is going to be hard to implement and test. Uh, community resource, like we said, we, wanna, we want to connect the community on this. So we'll have workshops and have ways to reach each other. Um, and feedback and, and further lessons learned are are critical. This is again the guide that we kind of went through and what our, our guide we're going to hopefully publish is going to look roughly like. You want to wrap At this it up? point we'll just open up, yeah, we'll just open up for questions, uh, concerns, additional comments. Yes. Um, I have a question about measures of effectiveness or performance. So you mentioned in an earlier slide that we could maybe use like the human performance measures we already use as like you know, in operational testing, you're looking at how well the operator can, can like, use the system to achieve their mission. Is it directly translatable to an autonomous system? And, like, maybe is the guide going to offer anything a little bit more specific than that? About the differences between, like, a human versus a system, autonomous system doing that? That's a long question. Um, yeah. And one of the things is you, when you get into like mission level metrics, the question is, you know, you're not going to have an individual metric on the system, but did it do, were you able to do the, the mission better with the system or not? You know, what kind of a metric is that? You know, but it, it's an overall effectiveness. So sometimes these may be very high level. Um, and, and again, it's, it's more of an, it's more of a process thinking, right? Because we just have to align ourselves. So if you come up with the answer, we will absolutely put it in the book. Yeah, it's something we're discussing um, back at our agency. And so that's why I'm wondering if there's ideas for specific measures of performance, because that's exactly the MOE I would think of. But then what specifically, what testable measure, right? What can I observe the system doing or not doing to make sure that it meets that MOP's and, threshold? Yeah, and especially when you have an AI, it may do it in a completely different way that's better than what you thought. And that's hard, right? Yeah. Because you don't want to define the path. I'll, I'll just say that, you know, Dr. Sadowski, who's the Army Chief Roboticist brief last year, and he said, you can't, it's really hard to standardize measures. They're really very tailored to a mission or tailored to a specific task or operation um, in most cases. So, it, you know, it's a horrible answer, but uh, it depends. The answer is, I think, the right answer. <laughs>
So even then, I think it would be really useful to have a large set of examples of ones that have been used. Oh, yeah. Having case studies where you see what someone else has done go a long way towards like, oh, yeah, I, I like that and I could reuse that, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's a big part about trying to get you in contact with the people because that, that's the issue is a lot of these case studies are not releasable. Yeah. yeah. But at least if you go talk to the guy, because that's, that's where we got the smartest, the quickest was talking to people doing it. Right. Or at least see a test report. Like I, I've learned a lot just from, can you just send me your test report and then I'll be able to see what were your test objectives? What data did you collect? What, how did you analyze it? What results, you know, how did you get to your conclusions? Like it just, it's a, it's a single stop to get a lot of information about what do they do and what do they do right? What do they do long, wrong? And, you know, is any of this reusable for the next program that we're talking to? So, yeah. Did you have another one, sir? I did. So the, your slide on the reliability growth piqued my interest and made me think, typically there's a standard for everything. Standards, guidance, no standards, something, you know, it's been around a long time, it gets formalized. And I didn't really hear you guys talk about that at all, so I was curious about what your opinion is on um, commercial standards, other industry standards, you know, D standards. I mean, this is a new and emerging area, right? So there really isn't a, a one size fits all cookbook standard approach for review and evaluation of AI systems and autonomy. So is there some area you guys have seen or any development? The, yeah, it's an emerging area, so I don't think standards are really existing yet. Although there are others working on this too. We're not the only ones working on this. So NIST has a whole committee, I think, that's doing very similar uh, cataloging and, and documenting of, of test processes and test methods and standards and things like that um, is the one that comes to the top of my head. But, but um, yeah, we're, we're ideally we point to you know existing commercial standards or whatever where they're appropriate uh, and then you know where we have a DOD unique item of interest or problem you know we have a we have a, a DOD standard and DOT and E is very interested in publishing authoritative guidance and standards in my opinion we're just not there yet because we just don't have it, most rules and regulations we have are built on lessons learned from somebody killing themselves or failing or whatever or you know and then you have to write a reg that says don't do that or do it this way, right? And, and we just don't have experience yet in autonomy, in my opinion, to really understand what are the, all the bad things you don't want to do and what are all the good things you really need to do. We just don't have that all sorted yet. But that's the point of this project is to find what standards can we identify early that will help, help folks move faster and, and safer. So if you have any suggestions on that, we're, you know, we're, we're, I keep saying. Yep. Figure more. it out. Let us know. We'll, we'll put it in the book. So our time is up. Um, we'd like to thank our speakers.